All right, are we live? I can never tell if we're live on time. YouTube's got this weird thing. All right, I'm going to assume we are live. So welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. All right, so today's topic, one that I've actually received for the last three weeks, and that finally won this week's uh, poll on Instagram by quite a large margin, and that is writing for the woodwinds. Okay, so this is a fun topic. It's a lot of fun. All right, but first... Let's kind of listen to what we're going to be working with so we can give some time for people to show up. Um, well, we're waiting to get started. Why don't uh, you guys let me know? Can you hear my voice? And in addition to my voice, can you hear what this is playing? All right. Can people hear it? All right, I'm going to assume people can hear it. Um, but yeah, so this is a little eight bar idea I wrote, I think like 15 minutes ago. I came up with it off screen because I figured I've showed you guys my process so many times already. And the topic of writing for woodwinds is a very, um, not complex, I'll say it's, it's going to be a lot of stuff that we're covering. We're going to be covering a lot of stuff. So I figured I might as well save some time. All right, welcome, Matt. Welcome, Jack. Awesome, you guys can hear it. So wonderful. Let's dive in, shall we? So today's topic by popular request is writing for the woodwinds. Now there's a lot of different places we can start with this. I think we're going to cover some brief instrumentation and then we're going to spend the majority of our time on actual strategies, actual application. Now the first thing we want to know is that the woodwind family actually consists of three smaller families. There's three subsections. We've got the flutes, we've got the single reeds, and we've got the double reeds, all right? These are all sorted by the type of mouthpiece they have and how the instruments produce their sound. So the flutes produce their sound by blowing wind across an opening, whether it's like a flute, whether it's like a recorder or a tin flute or something or a whistle. Um, some whistles are considered woodwinds, some are considered percussion. But the most common ones you're gonna find in an orchestra are the piccolo, the flute, and occasionally alto flute and bass flute. So you'll notice that I have formatted these names slightly differently. If it's in bold, like the flute, it means it's very common. All right, you can expect to find this in an average orchestra or your average sound library. If it is bold, but italicized, it means that it's pretty common. Like you're gonna find it in a lot of orchestras uh, and a lot of uh, sound libraries, but they're not standard, at least not in sound libraries. Because if it's bold and italicized, that means that this is a secondary instrument. So a flute player is going to be responsible for playing the piccolo when needed. One of the flute players, typically the last chair, so second or third, depending on the size of your orchestra. If you write, oh, piccolo at this part, their job is to put down the flute, pick up the piccolo, and play that part. So if it's in italics, that means this is super rare. All right, You are not going to have this guaranteed in every symphony or orchestra, so you need to do your due diligence if you are going to be writing for an actual orchestra and ask about this. And you're probably not gonna find them outside of professional libraries. So I didn't get access to individual bass flute and alto flute until I got the Spitfire Studio Professional Woodwinds. All right, so next we have these single reeds, which produce their sound by buzzing a single piece of single wooden reed against the mouthpiece. This involves the clarinets, the bass clarinets, and saxophones. I included the saxophones because they are technically single reeds, but as the italic shows, you will very rarely ever find saxophones in an actual orchestra. You can, uh, Gershwin did it, certainly, uh, but they're not as common just because they're from a different era, all right? Then we've got the double reeds, all right? Double reeds are exactly what they sound like. They have two pieces of wood strapped very tightly together that form their mouthpiece, and they produce their sound by buzzing the two of them. We have oboes, the core inglés, which is the equivalent of the piccolo. An oboe player needs to put down the uh, oboe and pick up the core inglés to play it. We have the bassoons and, of course, the contrabassoons, which, again, a bassoon player has to put down the bassoon and pick up a contrabassoon to play it. Now, something important to keep in mind about each of these instruments is they're wind instruments. All right, They're produced with the breath of the player. And as is very common with most wind instruments, whether brass or woodwinds, their timbre changes quite a bit, all right? The strings are gonna sound pretty much like a, like a violin sounds 
basically the same no matter where you play in its range. Down near the lower end of the strings all the way to the highest pitch that a violin can play. They're going to sound somewhat different, but the quality and personality of a piccolo sounds dramatically different at the very top of its range than it does at the bottom. At the very bottom of its range, the piccolo sounds incredibly weak, incredibly frail, incredibly soft. Can't really play louder than a piano or soft. And it's very haunting, but very weak. And at the very top, it becomes ridiculously shrill, ridiculously piercing. So the qualities change based off the amount of air and the amount of pressure used to play each of the notes. As a general rule of thumb, for the flute family, as you start at the bottom of their range, they are going to start very soft. The higher up you move in the range, the more shrill, the more powerful, and the more piercing they are going to become. Somewhere in the middle, they're going to sound very clear and very flute-like. The single reeds follow the same issue, right? the same pattern, I should say. Near the bottom of their range, they're going to sound very round, very warm, very soft. Near the top of their range, it requires a lot more pressure, a lot more air, and they start to become more shrill, more thin, more bright, more piercing. Uh, not as dramatically as the piccolo or the flutes, but still same general pattern. Now, the double reeds tend to go against the grain. All right, near the bottom of their range is where they are the most powerful, all right, where they feel the most strong and forward in a mix. Whereas the higher you go, the thinner they get, and consequently, the softer the sound gets. Now, this is all wonderful, this is all great, this is all interesting, but there's a ton more to each of these instruments than just this. So I recommend taking up the study of instrumentation. I'm gonna share some wonderful resources later, uh, first and foremost of which is Tabletop Composer. Yay, it's me. Go to Academy tab and boom. Look at this, a free class on instrumentation. You'll learn about the woodwinds, the brass. You'll learn about the string section. You'll learn about keyboards, percussion, all that stuff, 100% free. I have been getting really wonderful testimonials for this. I'm gonna be adding to the website. And yeah, so check it out, really cool resource. But today our focus is primarily on learning about using these beautiful instruments. Now, the greatest strength of the woodwind section is their variety of sound, all right? The clarinets sound, the single reeds sound different from the double reeds, which sound very different from the flutes in terms of personality. And even within those subgroups, they have very different personalities depending on where they're playing in their range. So to get the most use out of these instruments, we have three guidelines. Guideline number one, and the most important, is only use what you need. The greatest strength of the woodwind section is their variety. And the fastest way you can destroy that advantage, destroy that reuse, is to use all of them all the time. If you want to make the most use out of these beautiful colors, these beautiful varieties, you should always have a reason why you're using each instrument. All right, so you want the flute because of its personality. You want the oboe because it can have a more articulate quality here. You want the clarinet because it has a very warm, round quality. Whatever you want, you have to have a specific reason. Guideline number two is to use score order. All right, the score order for the basic ones is here. Piccolo, flute, oboe, clarinet, bassoon, and contrabassoon. These are the most common ones you're going to find. And by arrange them in score order, I mean the piccolo should always be written above the flute. The flute should be written above the oboe. The oboe should be written above the clarinet, above the bassoon, above the contrabassoon, in terms of pitch. Now, there are exceptions to all of these, but this is the general guideline. And that is because of guideline number three, which is to use registers of comparable power. So I think the third time I'm going to talk about this, but each instrument, their quality and their sound changes depending on where in their range you are working. And because of that, some ranges, some registers are more preferred for certain instruments. Uh, like the oboe prefers its lower two register, like its middle register and its lower register. Same with the Corian glace. Uh, the, pic the piccolo prefers the middle and higher register for different reasons. Uh, but you want to make sure that whatever register you are writing the flute in, say the flute is being written in its optimal register, you want to make sure that if you're using the oboe, it is also being written in its optimal register to help make sure that they balance well. If the flute is in a weak register, then the oboe should not be in a strong register because then they're not gonna balance well with each other. Again, this is all kind of stuff about instrumentation. If you wanna learn more, check out my class, check out, there's plenty of YouTube videos, plenty of great websites, but these are just kind of the general rule of thumb. So now let's get to the interesting part, all right? The part that you guys are probably all here for. 
This is common uses. There are five common uses, five strategies you can use the woodwinds for. They're going to bring a lot of life to your arrangements. And number one is pretty self-explanatory. You just have the woodwinds play their own parts. All right, they're a very capable section. They're very strong. They're very beautiful. You can have woodwinds playing all of the layers at any given point in your music. They just have like a solo, sec like a, a section solo of the woodwinds. You can have them playing most of it with maybe a little bit of strings in the background. You can have them playing just flourishing parts in the background, whatever. The woodwinds are more than capable of holding their own at any different layer. But while you do this, there are a couple of general guidelines. The first one is that it is going to take three to four woodwinds playing in unison to balance with any one brass instrument, as long as that brass instrument is unmuted. So let's say you've got a trumpet player and the trumpet player is playing the melody and you want the flutes to play a counter melody that balances around the trumpet, All right? In order to match that strength of the trumpet, you need three or four flutes playing the part together to match that one trumpet, all right? And if you're going to do that with, uh, you're gonna use it for strings, it's similar. You only need one though, as long as your string section, for example, like violin one or violin two or the celli or the violas or whatever, you can have them play one instrument, one flute versus one section of the strings and have them balance very well. As long as it's anywhere from pianissimo to mild mezzo piano, or mezzo forte, sorry. So pianissimo to mezzo piano, mild mezzo forte. If you get mezzo forte or louder, then you're gonna start needing two, maybe three flutes doubling again in unison to match the width and strength of just that single string section. So this is the simplest. You can have the woodwinds play a melody. You can have them play the chords. You can play them play have them play a counter melody. Uh, for the woodwinds, I should mention, it's just one to one. One flute can balance one oboe. There's gonna be some differences here and there in terms of quality and how well they blend. We can talk about that later. But for now, woodwinds playing their own parts, that's pretty basic, it's pretty simple. Um, yeah, so if we wanted to use an example, here is this sketch that I showed you guys earlier. Why am I getting the spinning? Okay, good, I was hoping it wouldn't crash. So let's listen to this real quick. All right, so here we have four layers in this texture. We have a melody, we have chords, which are split into two voices, second violins and violas, and we have the bass line. Each of these are being played around mezzo piano, so nice and soft, which means to balance each layer, melody, chord one, chord two, and bass line, we only need one woodwind. So let's take this little part that I used for the first violin, we'll cut it, and let's just put it in the flute, shall we? I didn't check the range, but if it works for violin one, it should work well for flute. Um, it's a little in the lower register, but it should be fine because it's, again, played at a soft dynamic. So we'll listen to it with the flute. If the flute is... There we go, let's play it through the flute one more time, just on its own. And if we play it with the strings. It works pretty well, all right? I might have some balancing issues just swapping it here and there in terms of like adding a bit more volume to this track or whatnot. But for the most part, it was pretty good. A nice, strong balance. So let's move on to number two, shall we? Let's put this back on the first violin. Common use number two for the woodwinds is doubling other instruments, all right? Again, this one is very just kind of common, all right? And it's very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, intuitive, all right? So you can double other instruments, whether in unison or octaves. 
The most common strategy, I will say, other than doubling woodwinds with other woodwinds, is to double them with the strings. And again, that goes back to just this issue we had on the previous slide. It's easier to balance a woodwind instrument with a string section because you only need one if it's soft. You only need two or three if it's louder. It's much harder to balance with the brass. The brass are much stronger. They are much, uh, much more of a what uh, Henry Brandt in his book Te uh, Textures and Timbres refers to as width of the sound. The brass are much wider, much more full than the woodwinds. So it's harder to balance. Not impossible, but because it's more difficult. The more common issue or common strategy is to just double the woodwinds with the strings. And in particular, there is a strategy called creating an enriched string sound, which is basically the idea that you take a string dominant timbre, so it still sounds like violins one, violins two, whatever section you've got, but they have a little bit of a shift in their timbre. They have a little bit more of the personality of a woodwind because you take whatever ratio you have, one, two, or three woodwinds based off the volume, you play them in unison with your strings, and you just drop the dynamic level of the woodwinds by down one. So if the strings are playing at mezzo forte, you drop the flutes down to mezzo piano. And what this does is it creates a very string heavy sound. So it sounds like the strings, but a very subtle impact where it takes on the personalities of the woodwinds. I just said that, I'm repeating myself here. All right, I don't know why. But the different kind of sound you get is based off the sound that you add. So flutes will create a lighter, more breathy type quality to your strings. The oboe is going to add additional edge. This works really well when you have strong articulation points where you want each note to be heard. The oboe is very good at uh, adding that to the string sound. You could have the clarinets be a bit more warm, a little more expressive quality to the sound. And the bassoon, which will depend on where in its range, but if you're playing higher in its range, it's gonna take on similar qualities to a flute with a little more edge, if you're going lower, it's going to take on much kind of the edgier quality of the oboe. Uh, so let's give an example of this. We have our violins. We are going to raise up into our flutes. We will solo this one as well. And all I'm gonna do, now that I have done, I have uh, doubled them in unison, I'm going to take the expression, which is the volume of my track. I'm going to drop it just a little bit we're gonna hear how these two sound when playing in unison. You're gonna notice it's gonna sound very string heavy, but with a slight little kind of fluty quality. And then this range would be appropriate for the clarinets as well. So let's give a sound on the clarinet. It would not be quite as appropriate for the oboe. So we'll leave the oboe out for this example, but okay, what happened to it? There we go. Wait, what's going on here? I'm trying to put it in the clarinet section. What's going on here? Huh. It's not. All right, I guess Cubase is acting up. Oh, that's why. It's because I had violin's part taken. That's why. All right, we'll take this down here. And we can listen to these parts being played by the clarinet and uh, strings now. You can hear how the quality is, again, very string dominant, but now it has a subtly clarinet kind of warmth. So this is just a very simple but beautiful, beautiful way to create more nuance in your colors. So if you want to have a very string dominant sound, but you want to add a little more personality, a little more rich quality, again, you can go through and ask yourself, which of these can I add in unison? Making sure, as always, to go pay attention to your general guidelines. Only use what you need, okay? If you're constantly using all the woodwinds, it kind of takes away the nuance. It kind of takes away the color and personality, and it just sounds like your basic default sound. 
because that is your basic default sound if you are using all the woodwinds all the time. So common use number three, this one is where we start getting a little trickier, a little more interesting, a little more complex. And this is the idea to enhance other layers through the use of heterophonic textures. A heterophonic texture is a very fancy way of saying that you are taking a layer, such as the melody, and you are doubling it with a variation of itself. Very frequently, these are reduced variations, which means that you take the strings playing the melody and you have, say, like the cor anglais, or like the or the oboe, or the English horn. Cor anglais and English horn are the same instrument. But you take one of those instruments and you have it play a simplified version of the melody. Maybe you just have it play target tones, which are the notes found in the chord underneath. Maybe you just have it play the notes that are on beat one and three. Whatever your strategy is, you take some of the notes out of the melody and you just have one of the woodwinds play that new simplified melody. This is very common, as I said, for the double reeds. All right, double reeds will very frequently play reduced variations of a melody or an ostinato or a counter melody or any other layer in your music, um, simply because they aren't as nimble as either the single reeds or flutes. Not saying that they're non-nimble instruments, they're just, when it comes to playing to an instrument's strength, the flutes and clarinets tend to be much quicker, much more nimble than the double reeds, which for, is why that they are more likely to play an embellished variation, where you start with the melody and you add more notes. All right, so let's try an embellished variation, shall we? Again, going back to that flute. So we're going to take the melody. We're going to go into the flute. I'm going to try and paste. There we go. My macros are not working today. My computer is on the struggle bus for some reason. All right, so we're going to play an embellished variation, right? So super simple way. I'm going to say let's just chop this up, and we'll just... We'll add a little bit more movement. Actually, let's just do this, all right? One way is called a rhythmic, a rhythmic embellishment. A rhythmic embellishment means that you take your note values and you just chop them up. So instead of playing a bunch of, um, instead of playing just a bunch of these hold held like whole notes, quarter notes and stuff, just chop it up into a bunch of eighth notes. So let's solo the flute real quick. Don't know why it's struggling with that. Uh, let's try quantizing everything, which just means snapping everything to the closest beat of the subdivision you've set. All right, that didn't work. Quantizing messed it up. Um, either way, we've got this variation, but let's chop since it's not working too well. Let's just we'll just add some kind of movement. All we're doing is adding Ah, that's why. That's why it wasn't working. It's because it's playing twice. All right, so we've got All we're doing is we started the notes, we chopped them up where they started. All right, let's do this, shall we? Since this is annoying me, we're going to start again with this. We are going to quantize before we change everything. So quantizing, quick tip. This is a quick way to make everything snap up. You see how there's a lot of kind of, this one's late, this one's early. It's human, it sounds nice, but sometimes it's annoying when you're trying to uh, make everything match up. So you start out, highlight everything. You figure out what's the shortest note value, which in this one is an eighth note. So you set your grid to eighth notes. Then you hit quantize up here. And you will notice how the notes will snap to the nearest value that you set. Boom. All right. So then what else we can do is we can do quantize ends, which will do the same thing. It'll take the end of the note and snap it to the nearest value. And so we see a little bit of overlap. I'm going to drop this over here. You want to go through and double pr uh, check everything because that'll happen from time to time. But here we go. We got this. So now we are going to chop this up. We're going to move this up. We're going to stay in key. And then we're going to chop it up. And again, we're not moving any of the starts of our notes because we want it to double the melody. 
we're just going to add movement between the notes. Chop it up again. And you don't have to do every single beat like I'm doing, um, but you can just find your own little rhythm. Let's just do a couple here. Uh, and then we are going to copy and paste these because it's the same part. And then we are going to add a little embellishment here, slowing down because I'm getting bored here. And then let's play this with the first violin and hear how it sounds. And again, you can spend a lot more time creating a much more creative doubling if you would like. Um, but it's as simple as that for creating an embellishment. If you wanted to create, for example, a simplified variation, let's give this one to the clarinet. What you could do is start again with your melody. And all you're gonna do is you're going to identify a couple notes that you don't think are as important. And you're going to get rid of them. And here I'm just gonna mute them. And so here we have the clarinet just playing the simplified variation of the melody. And if we double that with the violins, if my computer will stop acting up, I should probably update my computer. It's been protesting lately because it needs updates. So let's hear this. Awesome. So the trick behind using these two is again having a reason why. If you want to have a reduced variation, which is what we just heard, you're having a woodwind and it's playing either in unison or in octaves by hitting only key notes in the melody, that is very useful for creating accents. All right? If you have a rhythmic element and you want to create accents on specific beats, a reduced variation works very well for that. If you want to add more energy, more kind of texture, um, an embellished variation works. In fact, this is a strategy that John Williams uses a lot, is he will create his ostinati or his runs or any of those other kind of flourishing textures in the backdrop by taking the melody and just giving it to the woodwinds with an embellished variation. This is something he does a lot in the scores to Harry Potter, one through three, the ones that he scored, I believe, where he'll take the melody, he'll raise it up an octave, give it to the flutes and piccolos, and he'll have them shorten the first values and just kind of go all over the place with an embellishment. That's how he creates a lot of movement without actually interfering with the melody underneath. So that was use number three. Common use number four is adding energy and excitement to your arrangements. And there are two common strategies for this one. All right, there are lots of them, but two of the most common are trills. All right, where you take a note and you just move back and forth. Like that, all right? You take two notes, if you either move up or down, again, uh, but you can use it for two reasons. You can either say, all right, I want important notes of the melody to get a little more accents, all right? So I'm just going to create a trill. Or you can create a pedal tone in the backdrop and just kind of create an atmosphere that way. So if we were to do this on the flutes, for example, let's do the atmosphere one first. 
Now I have an actual way to do trills in my library, but I'm not going to worry about that too much at the moment, just because that would have to be, I'd have to activate a new track. So we're going to take this. I'm going to show you a little shortcut. I'm going to copy and paste this. If I can. I'm going to raise this up. We'll do a major, a major second. And all we're going to do is I'm going to say, all right, I need, I want these to be 16th note trills. So I'm going to chop this one up into eighth notes. I'm going to chop this one up into eighth notes. Now let's drag this one back first. I'm going to chop this one up into eighth notes. I'm going to highlight everything. We're not cut it back. So now we got a nice little trill. Let's drop the velocity a little bit so it doesn't sound too shrill. All right, super kind of slow trill. It's a little soft, but you can hear how it creates a nice little atmosphere in the backdrop. If we mute it, unmute. Very subtle effect, very common, especially in the Impressionistic era. Debussy used trills as pedal tones a lot. Um, Another way you could do it is, again, like I said, if you want to bring more attention to particular notes in your melody. So let's copy and paste this again in the flutes. And let's just say... So we'll say these first notes and this last one. I'm going to turn into trills. Take these. We're going to do the same strategy I just did. I'm going to take these. I'm going to paste them up. We're going to chop this one up, chop this one up. Highlight. All right. I'm going to take, do the same thing over here. And we'll do this one over here. We can hear how this doubles and just kind of brings a little more attention to the spots. And it's a little loud. I'd want to make it a little softer. But I'm gonna drop, I'm gonna raise it up an octave. All right, it's awesome. Not the prettiest version, but you get the idea. The other idea, which is one that is, what happened to my, I accidentally closed it, so Control Shift T brings them right back. Oh, uh, let's do, start from the beginning. Nope, let's do presenter view. There we go. Where were we? Enhancing other layers. Oh, yeah, adding energy and excitement. So that's number one, trills. Number two are runs, which are a very exciting kind of popular strategy that lots of people want to learn. And it's the idea that a trill a run is just a long scale that is used to help emphasize a specific beat. And writing them is much, much simpler than you think. All right, step one, you want to pick the note, pick the beat that you want to double, that you want to bring accent or more energy to, and you are going to add that note. So again, let's say flutes. Let's just stick to flutes because we've been using the flutes and it's a little easier. So step number two, we're going to paste this. We're going to go in. We are going to mute the melody. And then let's just say at the very top, I want to add an A. All right, I want to accent this last A. So I'm going to... Add an A. And I next step, I want to start the beat. I want to pick the beat that I want to start my run on. All right, the beat and the note. So let's say, let's just start over here on this E. So we'll double this E. All right, the next step is to just 
build a scale. All right, take the time. We're going to build a chromatic scale here. In fact, let's actually, let's drop this E down an octave. So we have a little bit more space to move. I must do a chromatic one. All right, so that's not quite enough time, especially this is a very slow one. All right, so let's do 30 second notes. Let's try that one. So we'll start again with the E. We're going to just move up chromatically or diatonically. You can use tuplets, you can use whatever strategies you want to just find your way to eventually, and we'll do a quick jump from G to A, but just create a nice little run. And we'll shorten this up a bit, and we'll hear how when this plays with the violins, it's going to create a little bit of an emphasis on that note. Oops, sorry about that. Right? You can make that happen in one beat, you can have it happen in two, you can do it with tuplets to stretch it across longer. Again, it can be chromatic or diatonic. There are lots of ways you can do it. Just follow that three step process and you should be fine. Pick the note that you want to accent and the pitch you are going to land on. Often, like I said, an octave above or an octave low, depending on which woodwind you're using. Pick the note or the beat that you want to start on and then just create a scale connecting the two. You can do arpeggios, you can do scales, you can do an upward moving where you come up, then down, then up, then down, then up, whatever you wanna do. You're just gonna find a way to connect those two spots. It does not need to be super complicated. So the last common use for the woodwinds that we are covering in this live stream is to create background textures. All right, it's creating kind of atmospheres for the backdrop of your music. Um, there are lots of strategies for this. You could use counterpoint, you can use ostinati. Uh, one of the most common is arpeggios, all right? And they're going to be very similar to the embellishments that we talked about earlier, the heterophonic embellishments, where we're going to start with the melody. We're going to shorten some of the, we're going to first reduce it so we find the uh, most important notes in the melody. And then we're just going to create arpeggios bridging the two. So let's see here. Flute, we had the flute here, let's, so let's just stick to it. Let's delete these notes that we just did. And let's figure out what the most important notes we think are. I think this A is important. This F looks important. This F looks important. This E looks important. A, F, G, E, and A. All right, so we're gonna take all of these. We're going to make sure that they are just about, let's delete the others, shall we? Let's quantize them so they all snap to the proper spots. We go. We are going to shorten them. Let's quantize again. The ends. We'll take this one, this one, this one, and this one. We'll shorten them to quarter notes. Then these are both whole notes, so we will shorten these to quarter notes and these ones to quarter notes as well. So now we have a very simplified variation of our melody. So what we're going to do is we are going to take these notes and we are going to bridge them together by using ostinati. Now an ostinato is literally just notes taken from the chord. We're going to go to part so it's easier to point them out. I thought it was going to be easier. Let's do flute. There we go. So the flute is the blue. My sketch is the gray. So under here we have an A minor chord. So we're just going to go. All right, then we got the F sharp. So we're going to come back down. Go down to A up to D, F, and all I'm doing is I'm bridging. You can create a little gap. You don't need to overthink it. An arpeggio is literally just the shape of the chord. You're playing each note of the chord one at a time. It can have a more rhythmically interesting identity. It can have a more interesting shape, whatever you want to do. If you want to learn more about this, watch my videos uh, on writing ostinati. So if you go to, if you just look up tabletop composer and you, you look up comma ostinati, uh, it should come up. You got my there. Tabletop composer. Um, 
Yeah, right here. How to write an ostinato. Write rhythmic strings. I have a part on this that will help you quite a bit when it comes to writing arpeggios. So all we're going to do is we're going to continue bridging this gap. Then we're going to see. So this one under here is C major. And this is C A minor again. And then we're just going to hear this. And you can hear how it creates a little bit more of an atmosphere, more of a texture behind. It's as simple as that. Again, all of these are ideas that can go as simple or as complex as you'd like. Obviously, you'd probably want to spend a little more time on each of these than I did, uh, but I am limited by the constraints of teaching this live. So to recap all of that, the woodwind section is divided into three subsections. You've got the flutes, single reeds, and double reeds. The flutes and single reeds tend to get more powerful and piercing the higher they move in their range, and softer and weaker the lower in their range you go. The double reeds will do the opposite. They start nice and strong, nice and wide and fat at the bottom, and they get much thinner near the top. The greatest strength of this section is the sheer variety of tone colors. You have three different subgrant families, each of them with their own unique kind of style and sound. And then each of the instruments within those families, their sound changes depending on where in their range they are playing. So in order to make the most of these woodwinds, you need to follow three guidelines, or you should follow three guidelines. Guideline number one, only use exactly what you need. All right, don't default to using all the woodwinds, default to using no woodwinds. And have a reason why you need to use each one. Number two for the guidelines is make sure that you follow score order when you're writing the parts. The flute should be written above the oboe, which should be written above the clarinet, which should be written above the bassoon. That helps maintain number three guideline, which is make sure that whenever you're writing with multiple woodwinds, you maintain registers of similar strength. If you follow pitch, uh, like score order, that shouldn't be too big of an issue. But if you want to make sure and double check, Make sure you study instrumentation, all right? Take some time, study orchestration, the instruments, their strengths, their registers, their tone colors, all that beautiful stuff. Um, then there are five common uses for the woodwinds. These are not the only uses, but they're very common. One, the most obvious, you just use them to play parts, all right? Flute, they can play the melody, they can play the harmony, they can play counter melody, whatever you want them to play, they can play it by themselves, all right? Part number two, you can have them doubling other instruments. Instead of having the woodwinds featured on the melody, you have them doubling the strings on the melody. This is a very common strategy. It's called an enriched string sound. Play your, have your singular string section playing, like violin number one, and double it with an appropriate ratio of woodwinds. Uh, flutes for a breathier, brighter quality. Clarinets for a more rounded, warm, expressive quality. Uh, oboes for a more edgy, articulate quality. And then bassoons, it depends on where in the range. If they're higher in the range, it's similar to a flute, but just a little different. And lower in the range, again, similar to an oboe, just lower. Um, so that was number two, which was doubling. Uh, number three is to, uh, I believe, add, uh, to enhance other parts by doubling with a heterophonic t uh, layer. Again, our heterophonic layer means that you are doubling one of your layers, like the melody, with a variation of itself. So you're doubling the melody with the melody, but this melody is either reduced, so you're playing the melody but only the most important notes, or it's embellished. So you're hitting each of the notes of the melody on the beat they're supposed to be hit, but you're adding more notes in between. Whether it's just a strict rhythm and you're playing like four eighth notes instead of two quarter notes, or a half note, or you're playing a kind of a flourishing chromatic thing or an arpeggio or what have you. So we have playing on their own, doubling other instruments, enhancing layers in your music. We have adding energy all right, so energy through trills or runs are the most common. Uh, and of course, number five, adding atmospheres and texture, which again, the most common strategy is to use arpeggios in between. Start off with a reduced version of the melody, the most important notes of the melody, and then connect those with an arpeggio. Now, the cool thing about this is the notes of the melody do not have to be part of the arpeggio itself. So you can connect non-chordal tones with an arpeggio, just make sure you hit them at the same point that the melody hits them. 
And those are the five most common uses for woodwinds. Resources for continued learning. Um, check out my website. All right, I have the Tabletop Academy, completely 100% free music education. I have free classes on harmony, melody writing, instrumentation, which you would learn more about the woodwind section, and arranging. You would learn more about applying the woodwinds and strings and brass and percussion and all that kind of cool stuff. Then if you want an actual book, I recommend this one, all right? Textures and Timbres and Orchestrators Handbook by Henry Brandt. That's Henry Brandt right there. This is a wonderful book. I am going to warn you, it is very, very dense. There is so much information he throws at you. Every once in a while, he forgets to explain something or takes it for granted that you understand something and you have to go and reread the chapter a bunch of times until you can piece it together. So very dense, but if you are willing to put through it, and you have a little bit of experience orchestrating already, this book is very useful. The most useful thing I got from it, and studying it multiple times, <laughs> admittedly, um, is finding out how to balance instruments. So if you liked this ratio that I offered you, if you thought this was super helpful, uh, these ratios actually came from this book, and different amongst other things. Um, but yeah, that covers this. So if you have any questions at Woodwinds or about Woodwinds, orchestration, music in general, I am now opening the floor for the Q&A portion of the uh, live stream. So any questions, throw them in the comments. I will be happy to uh, answer them as long as they are music related and appropriate. But uh, yeah, was that helpful? Was that useful? Was any of that good? All right, Jack, Matt, welcome. Um, been after the sound for a while. Awesome. Um... Jack, oh, I've been at this stage of the composing before. The is it my daw or is it me stage? Yes, and especially with my daw being very old, I run into that a lot. Uh, recently, for whatever reason, my expression maps were not working on a piece I was writing for a soundtrack. Um, so, like, I would go in and I would tell, like, with the expression map, uh, which this isn't, this is just the legato cello, so it doesn't have a lot of things. But for my short, for my short celli, I have a lot of different short articulations in there. So I have an expression map saying, play this version, play this version. It just wasn't working. It was annoying. Uh, World Music Theory, welcome, welcome. Did you get a chance to check out the Rachmaninoff Piano Concerto? Yes, yes, I did. Oh, it was beautiful. I, I listened to that the moment I got off the stream last week. So thank you for the recommendation. The second act was... I don't know. I, I, I go back and forth between the second act and the third act being my favorite. The first one was nice. I don't think I paid attention as much to it because I was tired after the stream. But the second act, the second movement pulled me in. And then the third movement just blew me away. Incredible incredible piece. So thank you for the recommendation. Um, <laughs> Jack. Um, and awesome. So it was super thankful. Uh, super helpful. Wonderful. We've had a small stream this week. All right. Um... Yeah, only, like, what does it say, like, five people on right now? That's nice, all right? A little intimate kind of gathering. Oh, uh, you guys got any questions? I'm just going to kind of let this play a little bit. Um, let's, let's double each of these parts, shall we? So we've got, let's just double each of the parts and see what it sounds like. And while I do this, if you guys got questions, throw them down below. If not, I am going out of town after this to meet with some friends uh, for dinner. So I don't mind leaving a little early either if we need to. Let's do bass clarinet for this one. Let's just hear how this sounds. The bass clarinet is super subtle. That bass clarinet blends really well with the celli. I think the bassoon would stick out more. Yeah, bassoon sticks out way more. So you can see what I was saying earlier about the double reeds giving a little more edge to the sound. Whereas the clarinets just give a much kind of subtler warmth and roundness. All right, awesome. So we got some questions. Let's see, uh, twenty-three. I'm here too. Can't think of any questions today, though. Still rooting for the thirty thousand tortilla stream, though. Ooh, awesome. So if y'all follow me on Instagram, I actually posted a Mexican recipe for y'all yesterday. 
Um, specifically, specifically because of this stream. Um, because my, uh, Theo, who lives right around the corner from me, I visited him just a little while, like last week. Um, and he was, he was, uh, talking about how it's just a bummer that he can't find any good chorizo anywhere. Now there's a bunch of Mexican grocery stores near us. He says it's all good chorizo, but whenever he smells it, there's something missing. He says there's a smell that he misses from his childhood. He doesn't know what it is, but there's something missing from the chorizo. So I just told him I'd bake him some and see if it works. I don't know if it's going to make it or not, but so last night I made about three pounds of chorizo. Uh, I always make a pound for my family when I make it, so I made it for my folks. Uh, okay, I'm gonna see them this weekend anyway, so I'm gonna go back to town. Um, I'm gonna so I made a pound for him and my tia. I made a pound for my uh, parents, and I made a pound for me and my roommate. So I recorded the entire process in my Instagram stories, and so I break down each of the steps for making chorizo. So, so go check it out if you want. Um, awesome. Yes, the thirty thousand. I made I made a couple dozen tortillas literally right before this stream because if I'm gonna make chorizo, I gotta have tortillas to go with it, right? All right, World Music Theory. So glad you enjoyed. The first one is definitely a slow grower, but the climax in the middle is amazing. It really is. Talk about that Rachmaninoff piece. Uh, so for those of you who want to listen to this piece, it is Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto. Is that right, uh, World Music Theory? Um, I listened to it last week. Amazing. Um, and it was I just looked it up on Spotify, listened to the top one. Beautiful, beautiful performance. Um, Jack, you know that I found woodwinds boring when I started composing. Once I started writing with them, I changed my tone. Do you think the woodwind section is less popular than other sections? Um, I don't think it's less popular. I think it's not used as much. So the woodwinds got replaced in lots of epic genres. Mostly because people didn't know how to use them. They didn't know how to write for them. Uh, so the woodwind sections got replaced by synthesizers. In fact, a lot of times when you hear kind of epic arrangements, you'll hear three things. You'll hear strings, you'll hear brass, and you'll hear synths. Then percussion and stuff too. Uh, but the woodwinds are nowhere to be found. And again, it's because lots of people don't know how to write for them. So I don't think they're not popular, I just think they're a little trickier. A lot of people just don't know what to do with them. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think they're, I don't think they're less popular, I don't think they're less boring, I just think they're misunderstood. Um, Music, world music theory also did you say last stream that you would be able to give feedback on our composition sometime in the month yes the last stream of this month february 23rd i think it's going to be uh will be a live feedback stream all right so to give me a break i don't need to teach anything um and i will be announcing later that week like earlier that week i think on that monday when i announce it i will announce the instructions for how to submit your pieces now i can tell you right now what they're going to be all right I'm going to have requirements, all right? Uh, in fact, I'm just going to tell you the big one, all right? There's Because I haven't ironed out all the details. But the biggest requirement is when you submit your piece, I need a specific ask, all right? Uh, it's much, much more difficult to give generic feedback to someone says, here's my music. What do you think? What's some feedback? Uh, than it is to get feedback to someone who's like, hey, here's my arrangement. Uh, I'm not sure if I use the woodwinds well. Can you help? Can you give me any thoughts? Now, a lot of my students, when I'm working with them one-on-one, -on -one, will just send them music and go, hey, here's my music, can I get some feedback? Awesome, I'm good with that, because I can listen and re-listen and re-listen to the piece several times and give written feedback. On average, I give between one to two fully written pages, front and back, feedback for each of my students. Uh, when I'm doing a live stream, it's different. I listen to it once, live, with everybody, and so I need to be able to have something specific to grab onto and something specific to offer right away. So if you are going to submit something that will be a requirement, you must give me a specific ask. What specifically do you want me to listen for? And what specifically do you want me to give feedback on? So if you want to be participating in that, two things. Prepare your piece of music you want to submit. And two, prepare your ask. Figure out what you want to learn. All right? And just, yeah, look out for the instructions on Instagram and YouTube. I'll be sharing them. Oh, um, Lewis, stream notes available. Sure, if you guys want them. Uh, let's see here. I... Closed it again, so control shift T. There we go. Actually, that's kind of cool. You guys watch that? Oh, it popped up on the other screen again. All right, anyways, control shift T will bring back a closed window or thing. So, what we're going to do um, file, share, share with others. Get your untitled. Okay, so, yep, writing for woodwinds. Anyone with link, copy link. Boom. All right. I just put that in the chat, people. All right. If you want access to the 
Uh, slides, here you go. It should be access as view only. I should double check that. Uh, share with others, anyone with a link. Yep, viewer. So you guys can get on here. You can just reread and stuff. Knock yourself out. It's like, what, nine slides? I didn't put any design into it or anything, so. Um, uh, 23 didn't realize following you on Instagram was so crucial. For the, yes, for the Trinity Zone. Yes, follow me on Insta. Let's see here. Let's actually go to my Instagram. Let's go to my profile. And watch my story. Look, my Theo wants Trinity so guess what I'm up to tonight? Boom. And then I go into each of the instructions, right? De seed and de vein, four ancho chiles and three pasilla chilies. The pasilla chilies are very important, but they can be difficult to find. I've only ever found them in Mexican grocery stores. And even then, only some of them. And they're kind of tucked away. But they are important. All right? Chorizo is not a health food. All right? I think I added three pounds of pork, which is also already super fatty. And in addition to the three pounds of pork, I had to add like a pound of lard. All right? So... Pro tip, if you want this to be healthier, if you want it to be better for you, I recommend just picking a fatty cut of beef, all right? 80-20 beef, or just using regular pork and don't, don't add the lard. It helps with the flavor, which is why I did it this time. I, my Theo was bummed that he can't find any tradies, so that reminds him of when he was growing up. So I just made mine full, hilt, full recipe, authentic as possible, uh, just to hopefully see if it's good enough. Um, but yeah, if you follow me on Instagram, if people like it, I'll do more recipes like that, right? All right, so Jack, I know the Bloodborne soundtrack has no woodwinds in it at all. I think because woodwinds typically learn towards positive emotions and there's no uh, room for that in that game. I would disagree with you. All right, so let's actually have some fun with this, all right? So, uh, Flute. Yeah, Flute has a nice kind of bright quality. But the oboe, the oboe is the king of kind of freaky sounds. Oops, that was still flute. All right, the oboe has a very kind of chilling, eerie little quality. Especially if you want to go with, uh, again, bass clarinet. can create dark sounds. No, they're used very effectively in a lot of uh, soundtracks. I would say Bloodborne doesn't use a lot of woodwinds because Bloodborne uses lots of epic music. Bloodborne uses uh, a lot of uh, the, a lot of the contemporary sound from media music is this big epic sound. And part of the epic genre, the, the woodwinds just don't play a part in that. And again, like I said, the woodwinds don't play a part because mostly the epic genre, trailer music, uh, epic music, battle music, stuff like that, was largely created by non-classically trained musicians. You had band members, rock musicians, jazz musicians, hobbyists with their computers who had no classical training, but they had computers. And because of that, you get uh, especially kind of rock and punk influences in the epic music because you see them, the orchestra being played like a band. You have the drum kit being played in rhythmic strings and the percussion. You have the uh, melodies being played by Brash. You have hits. You have all these kind of really cool things that you would find normally on a drum kit, but being played by an orchestra. And so the woodwinds, just being kind of one of the more trickier sections to learn because there's so many, so much nuance and so much use, uh, and they just aren't as common in modern music. Pop music uses string sections. Pop music uses brass. It doesn't use woodwinds very often. Um, they just got replaced by synths. So that's why I would say Bloodborne uses it. Uh, <laughs> yes, I am. I am calling you out, Jack. Uh, <laughs> Matt. Uh, 23, clarinet can be mysterious and eerie with exotic scales, too. Yes, the woodwinds, like I said, the woodwinds are the kings of variety. Woodwinds can play so, so much. The only section of the orchestra that has more variety in sound colors is percussion. And that's not really fair because percussion can be literally anything that you hit to make a sound, right? Dan, oboe and English horn are both great. Wish more instruments sounded that way. Yes, uh, oboe, English horn are amazing. Uh, the English horn is, or the court anglais, is just the oboe, just that plays lower. So 
So if you're playing with the oboe and the oboe can't go too low, the oboe and quarry and glaze are both very limited instruments in terms of the range they like to work with. They have such a beautiful, rich, unique quality, but they tend to be more temperamental than the other woodwind instruments. The oboe is also infamously difficult to learn for young people in band. Uh, lots of clarinet players will be swapped over to the oboe because their band director desperately needs an oboe player, and they struggle quite a bit. They are challenging instruments, but incredibly rewarding if you work with them, and the core anglais is, like I said, helps to fix some of that not shortcomings, but hit some of the, fix some of the limitations of range of the oboe by allowing it to go lower and maintain that still haunting, beautiful quality. Um, let's see here, Jack Matt Lewis. I'll be back next week with another hot take to start a comment fight. Hey, comment fights work well for me. All right, YouTube doesn't care what the comments are, just as long as there are comments. All right. Um. <laughs> All right, so you're you're you so you're already using the woodwinds to write a sad piece. Oh, is that for the homework assignment? Jack is part of my emotions class. I believe this week we we're talking about dark and sad emotions, uh, and I kind of chewed Jack out a little bit just because I know the kind of music he can write because he's done homework with me in the past with private lessons and such. And he sent these beautiful pieces. And mo in this last assignment, okay, it was good. I'm not saying it was a bad arrangement. I was just sitting here going like, oh come on, I know you're better than that. It's an eight bar melody. It's assignment. Uh, so I, I'm just kind of calling you out, Jack. Sorry about that. Um, yes, lots of, ep Dan, yes, lots of epic soundtracks use the duduk as well. The duduk is a very ancient instrument. The double reeds are amongst some of the most ancient wind instruments on the planet. Um, uh, because it's very easy to find two wooden reeds, strap them together, and find out they make a noise when they vibrate against each other and you blow across them. Um, the duduk is, I believe, primarily Middle Eastern. And it was recently, or well, I guess that's not too recently, but recently, I will say, featured in the soundtrack of Dune, where Hans Zimmer and his Duduk player actually created a contrabass Duduk uh, by buying a bunch of PVC and just straight and lengthening the size and proportions. Um, it has a very interesting now. I unfortunately don't know if I have a Duduk library. Let's see here. Um, let's see. <laughs> yes, Jack. Um, um, uh, oh, it's Armenian. Armenian. I apologize. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. That shows my ignorance. All right. Um, all right. Awesome. So it's a little quiet today. That's, that's an hour though. That's an hour. We just did an hour on woodwinds. It is getting very warm and it is a beautiful day, an uncharacteristically beautiful February day in Michigan. In Michigan, most February is usually gray. It is usually cold and is very slushy. Uh, with all the snow, it starts to melt, but it's not cold enough to completely melt, so it just turns into slush and ice. So I think I'm going to call it. I think I'm going to call it today, my friends. So thank you so much to all of you who stopped by. Again, one last thing I will say, go to tabletop. No, nope, not tab. Uh, tabletopcomposer.com. You can get sign up for private lessons. You can check out my free resources like the Academy and my blog posts. Um, you can also check out my eBooks and you can buy these slides and such from my longer videos, my notes and slides. So check it out. Lots of cool stuff here. And yeah. So, I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. I'm going to go enjoy the sunshine a little bit while we got it. And, yeah. So, see you all next week. All right? Have a good one. Am I supposed to say something else? I feel like I'm supposed to say something else. Eh. Follow me on Instagram. If I have an announcement, I'll make it there. All right? See you all. Bye-bye.